Please welcome back to the stage, moderator for our closing fireside chat, Gideon Litchfield, and Thanasi Delos, co-founder and CGO, Civics Unplugged. All right, hello and welcome back again. Um, so Thanasi, you are leading a movement for um, social change, civic engagement, and what you're doing is enabling pe young people to form projects that are around civic, civics and civic education and, well, I don't know, why am I telling people what are you doing? You tell us what you're doing. How are you, what are you enabling people to do and can you give us some examples of the kinds of things that they're doing? Yeah, for sure. Um, we are all about a term civic innovation, right? I think that the term activism or the term civic in education have these contexts behind them that people's brains automatically snap and they're like, okay, I know what you're doing. It's not that interesting. It's been done over and over again. Um, move on. Civic innovation though is this idea that a young person or any person can find where their passion and their individual skills align with their community's needs so that they can truly make change. It's all about emerging technology, it's all about new forms of education, and it's all about um, giving agency to young people. And so Civics Unplugged works in all 50 states and 74 countries around the globe. We serve a thousand fellows a year through our Civic Innovation Fellowship Program uh, that teaches not only new systems and new ways to make change, but also teaches personal development. A lot of these young people are operating in silos. They don't think that there's any other young people that are doing the same work that they're doing, that care about the same things that they're doing. And so we're all focused on giving them a community and the personal development skills so that they feel that they are uh, able to be leaders, either right now or 10 years from now. Uh, and then after they graduate from the program, we give them grants, no matter where they are in the world, to um, pursue a civic innovation project in their own community. Uh, a lot of what Civics Unplugged is, uh, is giving the power to the kids. So the grants are all decided by the Civics Unplugged community. It's a democratic vote. That's where the funding is distributed. I have no say. I have like one vote, which sometimes sucks. Um, but uh, yeah, the, listen, these young people know what their communities need. They are the point of contact. I don't know what communities anywhere other than my community needs, and so I shouldn't be the one deciding what these kids are doing and, and how the money is spent. So we give them the money, we give them the mentorship, the agency, but after that, it's up to them to change the world. So what? that's CU. And what kinds of things are they doing? Can you give us like two or three examples? Yeah, um, so in our first cohort, we had this wonderful human, Zoe Jenkins, who's actually coming back to Civics Unplugged to work with us uh, over a, a couple time off from college. She uh, started a youth-led diversity, equity, and inclusion fellowship and curriculum that uh, started in Kentucky, because that's where she's from. Uh, it expanded to the US through CU's network, and then Civics Unplugged went international by mistake, which is another story, but um, her organization, DICE, started serving young people in uh, Southeast Asia because the fellows from Southeast Asia saw Zoe's curriculum and saw what Zoe was doing in CU and were like, we can use this as a foundation to solve some of the problems that we have. And so we funded both DICE United States and DICE South Asia. Both are still running. Um, we have young people working on uh, distributed voting and decentralized like voting technology that helps people access polling and vote online. We have young people working uh, to get people to the polls, traditional democracy work. Uh, and then we have some, some really fascinating things in regenerative economics, regenerative agriculture and farming that young people are focused on. Uh, there's a lot of work in distributed technology, blockchain, Web3 that we fund. So it's, it's, it's pretty much uh, all over the place, but all led by kids under the age of 21. So what is the... Hey. <laughs> What do you think is the unmet need that Civics Unplugs meets? Um, what, what is it that you're making available to kids that they're not able to get from any number of other funding organizations or philanthropies or, or whatever? Yeah, um, I think we have all recognized, especially the folks in this room, that there are problems we need to solve. That's not a very insightful comment that I've made. Everybody knows that. but. Um, what we haven't solved are the underlying issues. If we want to solve these new problems, we have to give the power to people who understand new technologies, social networks especially, um, and, and how the world is, is, is changing. And those are the young people. However, my generation is the most probably depressed, the most affected by mental health, the most disconnected uh, generation that has ever walked the earth. And so when you, when you look at all of these organizations, like funding is great for young people, but what's really also important is community and agency. Civics Unplugged strives to connect these young people and make them feel that they are working together to solve a common issue instead of working in silos. 
Um, it's one thing to give a bunch of funding to a young person and say, well, we helped you change the world. But really, we need to be tackling these underlying issues of a lack of community among young people and among everybody, a lack of trust in our systems and in each other as people, um, a lack of faith in ourselves and our personal ability to do things. Um, and so Civics Unplugged at its core is, is solving a crisis of community. We are trying to be the community for young people that want to provide community to their friends, to their towns, to their cities, to their countries. We, when we were talking earlier, you talked a bit about this question of trust. And you said there is this problem of distrust that traditional philanthropies have towards young people who are looking for funding for projects. Yeah, um, <coughs> I think there's a, I think all philanthropy and all just financial exchanges right now operate in the assumption of distrust. They, they assume that everybody is being a um, little bit snaky on the back end, which, which I mean exists for a reason. But um, when it comes to funding youth movements and funding social change, uh, there needs to be trust on both sides. There needs to be trust from the philanthropy side or from the funder side, but there also needs to be trust um, the other way around. And so when I, when I think about like, what we need to do to, to make change, it's a lot about um, my personal story. I, I, would not be, um, I would not have found a Civics Unplugged had it not been for two adults in my life um, who gave me trust and agency. They never gave me money, they never gave me a dollar, but they allowed me to have faith in myself and believe in myself to take a huge risk. And what Civics Unplugged is, is trying to scale that to all the kids that we serve. And so when a philanthropy is thinking about funding youth movements, it's not just about the money, but it's also going to each individual person you're funding and saying, we're putting our network behind you, we're putting our name behind you, and I personally am putting my energy into making you succeed. Because that feeling in a young person is, is you, it's priceless. You, you, can't, you can't, no amount of money does that for a young person. But you know, everybody in this room, I see a lot of adults and a lot of young people. Um, if you turn around and you say, well, what's one young person in my life and how do I make them feel that they can change the world? Like that's the, that's the biggest thing. Right, so it sounds like Civics Unplugged is saying to young people, like, we're like you, we believe in you. Here's some, you know, here's some support, go away and do something wonderful. And then some, some of these people are going to you know, build projects that then grow. They're going to start seeking funding probably from a wider range of more traditional sources. So now let me play the role of the, you know, the philanthropist. I say, young man, <laughs> this, 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 uh, this blockchain voting uh, idea of yours is awfully newfangled. Uh, what do you know about the world? How, how on earth do you think that you can reform this entire system? Why should I give you my money? When you come across that kind of relationship, and in particular, <clears throat> yeah. That was Good. really, really well done. <laughs> Amazing. Years of education to get that. <laughs> um, but, so, but, you know, you are encountering, as I said, as I said in my earlier comments, like a somewhat disillusioned generation of people like me who think, well, the world is a really messy place. It's a really complicated place, partly our fault. Um, and, um, and, you know, who are these kids coming in who think that they can just upend it all and reinvent it? So how do you, I guess, bridge that gap? Great question. I, I think that a lot of, at one point, me too, like, it, it's very, it seems adversarial. It's like young people are coming, they're like tearing down the system, they're saying like, it's our turn, it's everything. And I'm like, I don't think that's actually the way to achieve change. And I, I, I don't know if that's the common like thought, but I, change happens intergenerationally. And like Civics Unplugged, the whole point, like the, my, my team members are adults and young people and we work together and we make sure that everybody in the CU community recognizes that the only way to make change is an intergenerational effort. So when we're going to those funders or when we're going to those venture capitalists, it's not the kid coming and saying, oh, this is my idea, I did this myself, because no one is formed, no one is self-made, everyone's made in community. And the Civics Unplugged community is, is adults and young people. And so when we approach these funders, they actually have a lot of trust because they're like, well, it's not just a group of kids that thinks they can change the world. Um, I actually think a lot of the kids in Civics Unplugged have grounded themselves into changing the small things instead of trying to change the entire world. Um, but it's also this group of adults who has backed these kids from the beginning, from before they had the idea, who have been there every step of the way guiding them. And so we don't just put our trust in the kid, we put our trust in the adult and they're, like, they're essentially their board of life that mm -hmm. has been backing them for years. Right. And that's the important part. Because I agree with you, like, you see me sitting on stage, you see any young person talking about changing the world, and you're like, what do they know? They've been alive for 19 years. Like, that's, they know nothing. And to a point, I agree. 
it's like we, we don't have all the answers, but we do have some new ideas and some creative ways of, of changing the world, but we need help. And so I think that the, the real answer is like you do it together and you, you embrace intergenerational change. Um, it's the only option that's left. Yeah. I like this phrase that you used earlier, made in community, um, because I think the traditional ethos of the tech world certainly was built around the founder, mm -hmm. the visionary, mm -hmm. the individual who sure pulls in a team and builds it, but you know, is a leader. And it strikes me that you're coming from a somewhat different ethos, and we're gonna talk in a second about decision making as well, but this ethos of things not happening because of individuals, things happening because of communities. So the question, the first question I have is, how do you, how do the people in, in, your, in Civics Unplugged or your, your communities, how do they build and maintain community? How are they, how are they using tech to maintain community? How are they, how are they creating and nurturing and maintaining community so that this kind of collective action can happen? Yeah, I think that the ethos of the founder was like such a great like story and it, it caught people's attention. But in reality, like any of the great founders or non-great founders that you can think of, were any of them self-made? Like all of them you're telling me never had a parent or an adult or a partner or someone like push them forward. Never had anyone that they talked to when they were about to quit. Like no one is made by themselves, and and having a strong community is is so important. Um, the way we think about community building at Civics Unplug, especially digital community building, right? There are kids from all 50 states, like I said, 70 something countries now, um, and there's a lot of people who don't think the same, and we embrace that. You know, the reason that kids come to the Civics Unplug community is not necessarily the reason they stay, um, but we have set a strong north star of civic innovation and, and trust across everybody. It's an entirely horizontal community, right? Everybody has one vote. And those like central foundational principles of the community have led us to be able to have a continuation of like new people come in, old people leave, it, the ethos is still there. And it's also, you know, one kid might come because they want to get into Harvard and they would think this is great on their resume. Another kid might come because they want funding. We have a ton of kids that come because they just want to hang out with other teenagers that like love technology and they can't find that. Um, so they all come for different reasons, but they all stay for another reason, which is I found my friends, I found lifelong partners, and I also found hope. Um, I think that's the only way a community sustains is if you have a North Star of hope. Right. Uh, and we, we work really hard as a team to try and kindle that. Let's talk about the, the, the one person, one vote, the decentralized decision making. So obviously some of the stuff you're doing, the, the dream DAO is a, it's the idea of a Web3 blockchain based presumably form of decision making. There's obviously a lot of excitement around Web3. A lot of people are trying to apply this kind of decision making to many, many sorts of projects. And there's also a lot of skepticism about, uh, about Web3 being a bubble, a Ponzi scheme, or certain, a certain aspects of it being a Ponzi scheme. But can you talk a little bit about why you think decentralized decision making whether it's on a blockchain or not, let's leave, maybe leave blockchain aside. Decentralized decision making as a protocol, as an approach, as a philosophy, why is it so important? Yeah, to give, to give some context, so Civics Unplugged itself is civic innovation, civics, leadership, nothing to do with blockchain. But a lot of what we found is members of my generation think already in a very decentralized way. They think in a very horizontal form of leadership, they think collaboratively, and they embrace new technologies. Like they understand the way cryptocurrency works better than a lot of people do, uh, like um, naturally. And so we figured, well, what does it look like if Civics Unplugged supported one of the first philanthropic, uh, nonprofit-led, decentralized organizations powered by blockchain? What if we let the kids build it and launch it, and we just gave them the funding? And so we did that in November. Uh, it's called the Dream DAO, and the entire goal is to provide young people the foundation, the capital, and the network to dive into Web3, specifically uh, blockchain and social impact. So we get them internships, we fund their projects, and it's a very small part growing of what we're doing uh, at Civics Unplugged. And the reason we did that is because you, know, you have to embrace emerging technologies and you have to give young people the opportunity to play and understand if they don't like it or not. Um, I had to do it, everybody has to do it. And when it comes to decentralized decision making, the zoom out of Web3, right? The ethos of Web3, decentralized ownership, trust, like none of that, needs a blockchain to exist. None of that needs cryptocurrency to exist. But the ethos is actually really important and very different from what we are traditionally seeing, especially in nonprofits. And so uh, Civics Unplugged was built to be decentralized and autonomous and run by the kids from the jump. We just didn't use tokens and didn't call it a DAO um, because it wasn't cool back then. And um, 
But, but uh, the trust that it's given, like these kids, they know that they can propose to the community if they want to change anything. They know that they have true ownership. And when you give people ownership of a community, they stay. They contribute more. They feel like it's theirs, right? If you're just a kid going through like a high school, think about it, you go through for four years, you graduate, maybe you give back, maybe you come back, but you never felt like, I can make this better. This is my school, right? But Civics Unplugged is truly like, it's my organization. It's my nonprofit. So it makes them more engaged. It makes them more creative. And the fact that they know they can propose something, and if it gets passed, we support their work, like, it sets the ceiling so high that all of these great ideas are, are just incubated and coming out on a daily basis. Yeah. I'm going to try to ask you a question I'm not even sure if I can ask coherently. So even less likely that you'll be able to answer it coherently. But let's give it a go. Because I think a lot about the future of democracy and where it's going. Mm. And in particular in this country, you know, we're seeing the two-party system and everything that it has built increasingly unable to function effectively for the world that we live in. Increasingly polarized, obviously, increasingly uh, stuck trying to take decisions that are for the good of a, of a country that keep pace with the change of, technolo of technological innovation, uh, with the misinformation, all of that stuff. Um, and obviously, in the Web3 space, there are a lot of people who, are, who think that new technologies can be a way to revolutionize, revolutionize the idea of democracy, to have a new forms of democratic participation. Um, so I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, do you have any ideas or thoughts on how the kinds of projects that are coming out of Civics Unplugged might play into the future of democracy? or? How they might, how you, what kind of intersection there might be with these between these very decentralized, youth-led kinds of decision-making processes and the very hierarchical institutional ones that we have in our traditional democratic institutions. Did that make any sense? Yeah, I, I think. <laughs> um, and maybe my answer will be even more clouded. Um, Civics Unplugged and the projects we incubate right now are great, but really we're trying to give young people the freedom to fail and learn early. Um, if you think about founders in the room, philanthropists in the room, just young people in the room, imagine if you started 10 years before you actually started pursuing your passion. Imagine if you started 20 years, 30 years. That's what Civics Unplugged is. And so maybe some of these projects will last 30 years and change the face of democracy. That I don't know. What I do know, though, is that the kids that we are serving will be the future chief innovation officers in their city or their country or the civic officers in their corporations. And that's what we're really geared up towards. Right, the projects right now, most of them are great and they're amazing, but they're not the majority of Kids Civics Unplugged. We work with 1,000 fellows a year. The majority of them are the first in their families to go to college. The majority of them are living in countries that don't have a democratic system to fix. And so you know, what we're trying to do is inspire them and set on this lifelong journey. Like Civics Unplugged is committed to supporting these kids until they are 90 and 100 years old. Um, hopefully, we'll be around that long. but. Um, it's about giving them the, the sandbox to spark their passions early, and the funding to spark their passions early, and the network so that they can continue their passions for, for a while. And so maybe the projects will, will last, but um, mm -hmm. what we're really focused on is like the, the individual fellow is a project in and of itself. Yeah. OK, so that, I, I think you actually summarized what I was going towards, which is what I'm hearing is for people who are watching what you're doing, or who are watching what young people in general are doing, the message is don't judge the project, judge the person. Look at this person's energy, their interest, their enthusiasm. Try to help them. If, if you, if, don't, don't be skeptical about the fact that this person is trying to build some kind of distributed voting system to upend democracy. Look at the efforts that they're making, at their learning process, at how you can support that, how you can support them in becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, and most of the kids at <laughs> Civics Unplugged aren't even working on blockchain. I think right. uh, like a lot, of, a lot of them are working on traditional like, interventions in their communities, getting civic education bills passed, making sure their, uh, their schools are getting funding. Uh, two of them, one of them just joined the California State Board of Education at 17. Um, another one of them just gave a TED Talk in Vancouver. Like, they're, they're doing traditional change work. Um, yeah, just venture capitalists, right? They say the best investment strategy is invest in founders, right? You invest in the people, people will make the idea work. Why is that not also true in nonprofits and social and civic innovation? Um, that's, uh, you know, my co founder Josh comes from a, a, a venture capital background, and he has been one of my biggest mentors, but also shown me that, like, if you invest in a good founder, you will always get return. Might not be monetary return, but you'll always get some sort of return. Versus, like, if you're throwing money at ideas, maybe the ideas will survive, but like, 
you have to you have to invest in the whole person. That's why we teach personal development too. Like mm -hmm. um, young people, where where in high school are they getting the opportunity to figure out what their leadership skills are? Where are they getting the opportunity to figure out what their what their passions are? Where they found their passions? Where their parents guided their passions? They're not getting the opportunity to explore that. And so it's like, in that point, just in that point itself, it's like avoiding a midlife crisis. It's like we're we're letting you learn all this now. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> wish wish I'd had that. Could have saved myself so many midlife crises. <laughs> um, all right, we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, so there are a couple of mics. Put your hands up if you want a question to ask, ask a question. And before that, I'm going to ask you one last thing from what we were discussing earlier. We talked about, about how you yourself navigate the space and the kind of the boundary between crazy and safe or safe crazy. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what it's been like for you? essentially trying to make your way and to balance, I guess, credibility with, with the excitement or with the inspiration of what you're offering? Yeah, I think two years ago, we started in 2019, <clears throat> if I was running around as a 17-year-old then kid telling people, uh, Digital First Civic Innovation Fellowship for kids, where we also give them part of the decision of where we give a quarter of a million dollars of capital every year, um, they would laugh me out of the room, and they did. Um, it, was, it was really tough, uh, but I think the paradigm has shifted. Like this entire event, SolveEd, um, I was just saying outside, is, is one of the coolest and most like, forward-thinking programs I've seen um, when it comes to supporting young people and young innovators because it's not just slapping a logo on something and saying we supported that kid. It's actually investing the time and energy that it takes to develop a young leader from a really early age. Um, and I think a lot of philanthropists, like I've, I've been talking to a lot of funders, a lot of venture capitalists, a lot of just people in general have... Um, found that it, it is about supporting young people early and it's become a lot easier. Um, and I think we were talking about that safe crazy and, and like regular crazy. Uh, I think it's okay to say really crazy things and I think it will be continuously okay to say like more outrageous things, but there are still like some things we, we don't want to touch on, like tokenization of youth movements, right? Like people should be able to ask questions like, I think blockchain's BS, mm -hmm. right? Like I think that's all BS and I think you're wasting these kids' time and I think that's a valid point. And so I think we're pushing the paradigm of what is the safe, crazy thing to say and like what conversations we can actually have. And I think as long as we're doing that, it's great. Right? But there are always going to be things that are just too early. All right. Any questions for Thanasi? Somebody. Wow, I'm just that good. <laughs> Put you back there. Oh, yes, over there. Thank you. this on yeah yeah uh, first of all thank you very much for the wonderful work that you're doing it's outstanding um, I'm, I'm wondering having been involved in and observed several uh, online voting uh, systems that have failed for forces beyond the technology like political blockades and and other uh, areas of resistance I'm wondering if you have a perspective on what's going to finally crack the barrier to on. Let's pick just pick the United States. Crack the the barrier to online voting in in the U.S. Culture change probably. Um, why the the reason that it's failed is because we're all operating uh, with different versions of truth. We're all operating in different like universes of facts. And so if we can't like all get on the same page, how are we going to have a conversation about decentralized or distributed or online voting? Um, if we can't agree what the facts of the day are. Um, I think there's a huge problem with misinformation in the United States. I think there's a huge problem with social media co-opting the minds of a lot of people and like sending them down a rabbit hole that they will never emerge from. And I think until we fix those problems, we'll never get to the conversation about how to vote online. Um, so a lot of my work has actually been focused on like pulling back and thinking, um, I think social media and misinformation are one of the greatest risks to not just my generation, but every generation. And so how do we devote a lot of time and energy into, into fixing that? And I know a lot, like even, even the Obama Foundation now, um, that's their, their top uh, focus area. Any other questions? We have 54 seconds. There's a counter here. Oh, there. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned when you're talking about resources to support young entrepreneurs about how you talk about um, it's people, it's financial. Can you talk a little bit about lessons you've learned on the risk side when it comes to, you know, how much is too much, 
how little is too little, anything on the financial part. For sure. Um, I think what we've learned at Civics Unplugged is that it's not a zero to 100 with a lot of the young folks that we work with. Uh, obviously, there are some unicorns, but you know, a lot of it is, is starting small and understanding that you know, it's a risk to drop out of school and do this. It's a risk to focus on it full time. They have high school. And so setting expectations and also giving them guidance. You know, a lot of the reasons people go to college is because they need four years of guidance. They need structure. And so um, what we try to provide in high school is a little bit of structural help, advice. Um, we go slow. There's uh, you know, $5,000. You unlock $10,000. You follow a path. You set milestones. A lot of things you learn later in life that we're just trying to skip that little period if they don't know that, and we're just trying to get that true. So I agree. It's, it's a huge risk, and that's why we don't just dump capital and leave. You have to invest your time and energy in order to see the, the fruits come to uh, bloom. And with that, we are going to take our fruits off the stage yeah. <laughs> and let this, this event move towards its blooming conclusion. Thank you so much, Sanat Fanasi. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>